welcome back to this class. Uh, today we are going to start a totally new topic. For the last several lectures, we have been focusing on solid waste uh, coming out from, from the municipalities, industrial solid waste coming out from industrial areas. But all of this waste has been in the form of uh, solids with some moisture. We are now going to start a new topic on slurry type of waste. Slurry type of waste means that you have waste which is mixed with a lot of water and comes to the waste disposal site in a pipeline. All the waste which we have dealt with earlier comes to the waste disposal site. How does it come to the waste disposal site? In landfills, how does the waste reach the site? In trucks, anything else? In trains, anything else? In ships and barges? Most of it comes in trucks, but do remember, waste is transported even in trains, in dedicated tracks, and waste is transported even over water, where the options are that the landfill is on the other side of a water body. In, in, in one of the US sites, the landfill is on an island. The waste has to go through water to reach the, the landfill. It is supposed to be the biggest landfill. And when the twin towers, when the twin towers fell down, where did all the waste go? What do you think happened to the waste of the twin towers? Vanished? So, it went to a landfill, right? And it was transported by various means to that landfill. However, that waste could not have been transported in the form of a slurry. Slurry disposal is for waste which is finer than sand, silt sized, sandy silt, silty sand, which can be mixed with water and then can be pumped. Can you mix gravel with water and pump it? No. You can mix gravel with cement and pump it in the form of a paste. You have concrete pumps, coarse aggregate you can mix in, in a paste. But we are talking of lean slurry, slurry which can be mixed with water, uh, waste which can be mixed with water and comes in the form of a slurry. So this uh, next uh, uh, half an hour or more, we are just going to get a flavor of the slurry deposited waste and see what are the aspects of uh, disposal which are important for us. So, uh, what kind of waste comes in the form of a slurry? Much of it in India is the ash coming out of burning of coal. And all of you have burnt wood or coal and you have felt the ash. Is it very coarse particles? No, it is something which will just fly and it is fine particles. So, coal ash is one. The second major uh, material is uh, mine tailings. Coal ash is coming out after burning of coal, mine tailings are coming out after crushing of rock or crushing of ore. So what happens is you want to take out iron or copper or lead or zinc, you dig deep down to get to the ore. And don't think that huge blocks of iron come out or huge blocks of gold come out like, like here is your gold. It doesn't come out like that. It is embedded in small proportions in the rock. To be able to extract it, you have to crush the rock and then process it by several steps to be able to take away the metal or take away the material which are value to you. In this process of crushing, the finer you crush it, the better it is because more is the material which is released. If I take a rock sample and crush it into four pieces, will the gold start coming out of it? No. But I crush it into as fine as talcum powder, then it is possible that some of the metals would be released. You have to still go through a lot of processing, chemical and physical, to get the extract. But you are left with the parent rock in its crushed form, which has gone through chemical processing, right? 
So, if you are doing gold extraction or if you are doing uh, lead extraction, you would have crushed this and you would have sent it through uh, uh, various processes where additional chemicals would have been added. In the end, what is left is this rock powder with these chemicals in a high water content. You mix it with water and it comes to you in the form of slurry. So, at the tail end of a mine, it is called mine tailings, mine tailings slurry. And there are other types of slurry with which you deal. So, we are going to look at some slurry uh, waste disposal sites and how do they look like. So, this is a, a, a huge area in one of the adjacent to one of the thermal power stations. This is coal ash. This is water. The ash is coming in these pipelines and being deposited here. And just to get an idea, maybe this is 2 kilometers by 1 kilometer in size. So, on, one, on three sides are hills. On one side is an embankment. Just like you create a water reservoir, you have created a, a pond in which the slurry will be deposited. The technique is very simple. You deposit your slurry coming out of a pipeline in a pond. Within a few hours, the particles will settle down and clean water will be at the top. You take it back for transporting more material. So, the water and slurry the water used for making slurry is just a medium for transporting these particles. And it is good because you can pump it. It is good. If you were to try and send this material on a truck, it would tend to fly out. So, you would have to containerize each truck. This operation can go continuously because the slurry pipelines can work 24 7 as long as the plant is working. So, we can see this embankment. There is a water uh, uh, decanting structure because the water has to go back. This is the embankment that you can see. This is the decanting structure. This water falls down into this well and comes out on the downstream side. So, this is being taken back again in these pipelines for back to the thermal station for uh, recirculation. Let us look at another ash pond. This is an old small ash pond in Delhi, not as of not 2 kilometers by 2 kilometers, much smaller size. But again, a lot of water being used. That is the inflow slurry pipeline. You can see that grayish water coming in. The, here it was not a closed system. Here the overflow water is allowed to overflow through the weir and it goes into Yamuna. So, if your settlement time is, is adequate, then clear water will go through. But if your settlement time is not adequate, what will happen? milky water will go through. So, at the time when this pond was operational, this ash is whitish gray. You could walk along the river Yamuna and you could see that in that portion, there was a milky water which was going in. That is the way uh, the uh, layers of ash as they are deposited. If you, if you excavate it, you can see horizontal layers of fine and coarse ash as it is hydraulically settling. First, the coarse particles will settle, then the fine. Then the next load will come, coarse and fine. So, you can see horizontal, very thin, thin horizontal layering. This is an ash pond at Visakhapatnam. It is almost like a lake, a 2 kilometers by 1 kilometer lake. And on one end, this is full, that is where the slurry is going. And you can use the ash for purposes of uh, infrastructure development. We will do this later. Here it is being rolled like a um, soil using the roller. Question that is in your mind is, is this material safe? Is it hazardous? Is it having some heavy metals? Is, can it cause problems? That is something which we will address. There is adequate information now coming in from the US that coal ash is causing contamination of the groundwater by a very few very rare elements like vanadium and boron, uh, very mild but definitely elevated. Earlier, most of the time this has been treated as not being chemically harmful and whether that is true for Indian ash or not is something which has not yet been corroborated. So, now uh, in America, all the ash ponds have to have liners like landfills. In America, just 2016, the US EPA has brought out the 
coal combustion residuals rules in which liners have become a big issue. Let us look at uh, another ash pond at Panipat. Here are the slurry. Lean slurry, I think 10 times the water to 1 time the solids. And this is ash pond. That is your thermal power station. This is a huge amount of ash. It is you can see if it is dry, it is going to fly. It is called fly ash. It is gives you dust emissions. So, you have to keep it wet or you have to keep it submerged if you do not want dust emissions from the. So, in dry summer months, these can create a problem. Here also they are trying to use the roller for compaction. Yet another ash pond at Delhi. Uh, I think this is the Badapur ash pond and uh, slurry inflow. They are growing greenery on it so that ash does not fly. Uh, embankment, so the ash is being deposited here, that is the water decanting structure. So, as you can see, the water comes into this is a well and uh, water is flowing in. Is this clear water? Not clear because very fine particles of ash take about 12 hours plus to settle. So, if the retention time is not 12 hours, then the, if the water starts to overflow before that, then the fines will go out. And the limits for di discharge to rivers is about 50 ppm. So, we have to meet the 50 ppm norm. Once this is full, they are growing some vegetation on it, so that you get a green look and the fugitive dust emissions are minimal. That is the thermal power station. So far we looked at coal ash, so we have about 80 to 100 thermal power stations each uh, producing millions of tons of ash. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, pressure on reutilizing ash and ash being silica uh, tendency to use it in earthworks or even better use the ash in cement because it has some pozzolanic properties and to make bricks, anything which requires material, I mean when you make a building. Uh, you need bricks, you need concrete, you need aggregate, coarse, fine aggregate, all these materials are dug up from mother earth. But now if you have got a waste material, in building blocks at, at least the ash is held now. In earthworks, ash is not held, it will undergo leaching. In building blocks, you will have a burnt brick or you will have in the cement, the ash will be confined. Let us look at tailings ponds, this is, this is a dam behind which the tailings are being stored. It is this dam is made up of rock waste which is coming out from the mining uh, operations. And these are just like ash you could see a whitish grey material, this is the whitish grey material of the tailings pond. And again here it is a cross valley impoundment, so you can see hills on all sides, right. And this was the embankment across the hill. So, it could have been a water reservoir or water dam. Okay. And when it is full, then you try and grow some vegetation on it to give it a green cover. This is yet another tailings pond. As you can see, this is these are the tailings, this is the water which has accumulated, this is the embankment. Uh, that is a slurry pipeline which is coming here, it is being dropped at the side of the hill, it falls down into the reservoir and this is gradual filling up of the reservoir with the tailings material. This is a second pond, uh, tailings pond. Similarly, this is at the third site again in Rajasthan, looks like a lake, wonderful lake. This is also a tailings pond. This is the embankment, must be about 10 meters high. You can see the pipeline, that is the slurry pipeline, slurry coming in, this is the deposited slurry, that is the lake. So, the water is ponding there, they are holding excess water and, uh, and this is almost full. Now, this embankment is full, still slurry is coming in, eventually they will have to raise the height of this embankment to fill in more material because the plant is continuing 24-7.
this is the highest tailings pond of the country, now no longer operational though, a 100 meter high dam. These are iron tailings in the form of a slurry. This is a huge dam built like a, uh, again see some hills here. So, wherever you can have a hilly area around you, you can just make embankment on one side. But if you have got plain ground, then what? You have to make the embankment on all the four sides to be able to make the pond so that you can settle down and uh, uh, sort of allow the solids to settle down and allow decanting of supernatant water. And just we will discuss this later. This is the rock toe of this dam. So, the dam is about 80 to 100 meters high, the rock toe is 10 meters high, the rock toe is 10 meters high. Important thing for you to remember is this slurries are full of water, so you have to design these dams as if they are water reservoirs and you will have seepage through this and the water will come out on the downstream portion. Uh, this is a, a photograph of, uh, I have not visited this, but in one of the magazines several years ago this was reported. This is the tailings pond for a uh, uranium tailings in, uh, in Bihar. It was having, it was affecting the local population. It is not only mine tailings which may come out in the form of a slurry. Uh, here is a process called uh, mineral extraction which releases a slurry known as jarosite. And have a look at this. This is a jarosite pond. No water, you can just see some yellowish material. It is a hazardous waste by the way. The waste is coming in the form of a slurry. So, here also you can see this some accumulation of water there which is being decanted. So, this is also hazardous waste being disposed in the form of a slurry. It has a liner and it will have a cover. But when you look at this whole area, you see that it is green outside and the vegetation is getting affected by the constituents of the slurry water and it is drying it out. Slurry ponds appear to be very simple to make, but you have lots of distress in them. Occasionally you will find it will breach because they are not well maintained. So, I will just give you some shots. That is an ash pond which has breached, this embankment has broken and material has flown out. You can see this breach, ash is behind this, it has flown out for few hundred meters. Because once the slurry uh, starts to come out, it flows like water. It does not stop at 10 meters of 20 meters. It is not a thick paste. And just to give you an idea how far this slurry has come. Can you see that? And embankment failures and the, you can see this is spread over here, this uh, slurry water and embankment has failed. Some more shots. This was one I talked about embankment. You can see that this embankment is also undergoing distress. Can you see these erosion gullies? This is stage 1 of the embankment. This horizontal line you can see, this is the crest of the first embankment. Okay? And this is now the second embankment. Now, the problem is the joint between the two embankments has not been designed properly. So, what is happening? This is becoming a seepage plane. Horizontal permeability at the crest of the old embankment is high and water flows out and is eroding this embankment. And this required remedial measures so that this should, once this gives, gives away, the whole mine tailings will come out. Here is a better shot about this erosion gullies. And here is the road on which we are standing. And here you can see, uh, you should stand on the top of the second raising and this is the original crest, you can see it is wet. So, and leads to seepage of water and some distress already beginning to show up at that site. This is another location where there was distress to the embankment and a, a nearby canal due to an ash pond being nearby. So, what I am trying to say is that uh, when you deal with uh, slurry ponds, once the slurry dries, it is just powder. So, it does not look very challenging. After all, you are just storing powder behind a embankment. Doesn't look. But you, if you do not treat it like a water reservoir, and especially when the heights of these embankments are now going 20, 25, these are incrementally raised. You will make a small embankment, fill it up, then make the next height. 
if you don't resign them like water reservoirs, water is very difficult to handle, remember that. So you always feel, no, no, pani kam kar denge, dur rakhenge, we'll keep it away from the embankment towards the center, it doesn't work. These, these tend to get breached and they have problems related to that. The same material which we are talking of, which is coming in the form of slurry, can also come out in the form of dry powder. So out of the 80 to 100 odd thermal power stations, we have one station in which it is being handled in the dry form and that's at Dadri. And here we are making a mound of the uh, ash. So this is the ash, it is coming on a conveyor belt. It comes on this belt, a, this conveyor belt goes up like this and then it falls and here it will form a conical heap. And this height is about 15 meters. So this boom spreader will spread this 15 meters high. And just so that you get the idea, this, this is us, people who are 2 meters high. So definitely this is about 15 meters high. And that's the conveyor belt on which the ash comes. So the ash is not coming in the form of a slurry pipeline. It's not coming on trucks. It's coming on a conveyor belt. The question you would like to ask is what happens when it's raining? Because the conveyor belt is not covered. So if you have fine powder and it starts to rain very heavily, what will happen? it will start to get washed away to the sides. So you have to take many adequate measures. What happens once the, uh, the mound has been completed, this is supposed to be a 50 meter high mound, then you can grow grass on it by putting some soil cover and give it a green look. All the visitors go here for a very nice green look of the ash mound. But I'd like to remind you that uh, a person walked into my office several years ago and he said, sir, I have come from this, this place. Can you tell me what to do about this? So this is also, I don't know what this is. This is also some powder which looks very much like the mound that we have got. <laughs> the, the dadri, it's also powdery. This is the old thing where they have done vegetation. This is the new waste being deposited. And you have, you can see some failures. So. He said, ye ye chalk hai. Mene ka chalk hoga. But what happens when it rains? You, so it looks so simple, you know, it looks so uh, easy to deal with. And when it rains more, so these fine particles start to move with water. And once they move with water, they'll come down the mound. And here this gentleman who had come was from some village, you know. So this water was coming down and it was going into the village. So issue is fine particles are very erodible. You want to contain them again, you have to give them a proper cover with proper vegetation. Otherwise they are prone to uh, erosion by water. So most of the fine powdery wastes which can be transported in the form of a slurry are transported in the form of a slurry. It's only the larger heterogeneous wastes which come to you in the form of a truck. So I've just opened a new, uh, uh, a new uh, world about slurry wastes for you. We have to design these waste disposal facilities so that they, they, they remain and they perform without affecting the people around it. And the real challenge is that because they are in the form of slurry, if there is a breach, they flow out. Now that, that kind of problem does not exist in the landfills that we are dealing with. If I have a municipal solid waste landfill, it will breach, it will come down by 10, 15, 20 meters. It will not travel for a kilometer. But many slurry ponds have breached where the ash has gone down a few kilometers, like water. Now it's like a pond has breached and then it has affected human beings and houses uh, on the downstream side. So the challenges here are how to design a system since it is slurry waste it has to be deposited between embankments so that the, it doesn't flow out but the larger challenge is nobody wants to design to the full height in one go because suppose my design life of my mine is 25 to 30 years and I make an embankment which is required for 25 to 30 years, it's a lot of investment to build it right in the beginning. Because it's going to fill up slowly. So 
So what happens is we make embankments which will last for about five to six years, make that investment, and then raise the height of this embankment. So this is very different from a dam design. In dam designs, we make the embankment in one go, whether it is the Bayas Dam or the Ram Ganga Dam, they're 100 meters high. In one go, in a year, six months to a year, we'll make the dam. Here, we have to either do this and go up. When this fills up, you, this is called the upstream method. Or you will use a method called the downstream method when this fills up. And so there are different methods, but this is called incremental raising of embankments. So this design is something new. So for slurry deposited waste, an important thing is incremental raising. So over the next few lectures, over the next few lectures, we are going to first study what are the properties of this material, especially what are the geotechnical properties. Then we are going to look at how we decant this water. We are going to look at how do we ensure the stability and how the role of the phreatic line is so critical in the stability of the structures. We are also going to look at how we can reuse this material because we don't want to be creating more and more ponds which are occupying more and more land. So we'll look at reuse of mine tailings, reuse of, of coal ash. And finally, we will also look at what environmental control measures are required. I showed you a huge ash pond which was dry. And every summer there's a you know artificial clouds of dust because high wind speeds, surface is totally dry. Very simple to say, oh, let's put some sprinklers on it. But 24-7 sprinkling of ash is tough. To keep the ash below water, you need a lot of water, which may or may not be available. So how do we balance uh, the problems of environmental impact to the people adjacent? I mean, you make a thermal power station at a place and you bring in a lot of water for cooling the thermal power station and also for making the slurry ponds. Now the water table was below. By putting water on land close to that area, you have gradually affected the groundwater regime of that area. How does that affect people? How can we prevent that? So these are some of the uh, issues that we will uh, do over the next six, seven lectures on uh, design of uh, uh, slurry ponds. Any questions which uh, come to your mind about slurry ponds? So we will find that there is lean slurry with which we deal, the one which I have shown you. More and more we are going towards medium dense and high, high concentration slurries. That means the quantity of water in the slurry is being now reduced because of less availability of water. So you have the dry mound on one end and the lean slurry at the other end. In between, you have medium concentration and high concentration slurries. So we'll also look at what are the developments taking in that area, that if the slurry is coming out to you in the form of uh, a paste, then how do you design that facility? So the difference is, uh, just intuitively, lean slurry flows by itself. Therefore, the ash spreads by itself. Water comes out. Where will the water go? It will go in the direction where the ground is sloping. So the slurry will gradually deposit the material. You don't have to send a dozer to deposit it. Slurry comes, uh, waste comes on a conveyor belt. It goes to a boom spreader. Does it spread itself? No. It is deposited in the form of a conical deposit. So dry waste will not spread itself. You will have to either spread it or you'll have to move the boom so that the cones are consecutively formed. So in between them, between dry and lean is the paste, the high concentration slurry. There also, the paste may not spread a lot, but it will spread more than a cone of a dry, uh, dry powder. So these are the new technologies which are coming up, and these are called high concentration slurry disposal. We'll look at that also as a part of our, uh, as a part of our design exercise, okay? All the best. Have a good day. Enjoy yourself.